We're back. Welcome back to the Empora Ski Cabin. It feels so good to say that finally after all of the lockdowns and whatnot. And sorry that last season got cut so short, but with everybody in lockdown and no skiing really happening at the end of last season, we didn't really feel it was worthwhile running a ski channel. So it's 2021, some people are skiing and Peace Off TV is back. And on the first episode of Peace Off TV, we've got all the need to know information about touring bindings. So whether you're looking for a lightweight pin binding like this one just here, or a heavier weight and heavier duty frame binding like this one just here, then we've got all the need to know information on ski touring bindings. So a ski touring binding is essentially a binding, obviously attaches to your ski, but it works traditionally as an alpine binding for downhill so you've got full downhill capabilities with a locked heel but good thing of a ski touring binding is that you can twist the heel or unlatch the heel and then you've got full ski touring mode and that allows you to attach a skin to the bottom of your ski and then twist the binding like i said into touring mode and then you can actually ski uphill and that negates the need for any lifts, meaning that you can get well into the backcountry without any lifts, any resort needed whatsoever. And that's really popular right now with all of the restrictions and resort closures around the world. And yeah, there's, uh, there's two different types of touring binding. So we'll start with the one that I've got just here. And this is called a pin binding or a tech binding or a pin tech binding. There's a load of different names, but we'll call it a pin binding for this video. And a pin binding essentially works with two pins at the front at the toe and two pins at the heel. And these work in conjunction with your ski touring boot, which has pin inserts in the toes and the heels. And you obviously need specific boots for these pin bindings. And a pin binding works by lining up the toe with the pins and essentially just stepping down, just like so. And same with the heel. These boots aren't mine, so they're not set up for my skiers. So but you essentially just stamp down on the heel like a normal alpine binding and that will lock off the heel totally. To go into touring mode, you essentially just have to twist the heel just like so and then lock off the toe to stop your toe ejecting as you're ski touring uphill. And that essentially just lets you tour uphill without any weight on the heels at all. And then the second binding or the second type of touring binding is what's called a frame binding. And you'll have to excuse this binding, it's all in pieces, but we don't actually have a mounted frame binding here in the office. So we're just gonna have to use this sample. It doesn't have any brakes, so it will have some brakes traditionally here. But essentially a frame binding works exactly like an Alpine downhill binding that you'll see on sort of 80% of the skis in resorts. It has a beefy toe unit and heel unit, but it's different to an Alpine binding in that it's got a frame, hence the name. It's got a frame linking the toe and the heel together. And this essentially means that you can unlatch the back or heel of the binding from the ski and turn it into a touring binding, like you can see just here. But as you can probably see, it is heavier weight and you do have to carry the whole weight of the binding through every stride. So that's a frame binding. And you could just step into a frame binding. This boot isn't set up for it, but you can just step in just like any normal Alpine binding. So that's the different type of touring bindings out there on the market. But what are the pros and cons of these bindings? Well, we'll start with frame bindings just here. So with frame bindings, they're obviously a bit cheaper because there's not as much tech technology involved in them. They've got full downhill retention, just like a regular Alpine binding. And secondly, you don't need touring specific boots like these Scarpa boots here. You don't need specific toe and heel inserts like you do with the tech binding. And that helps with the value factor as well because you don't need to buy a second pair of boots. You could just go ski touring in your Alpine downhill boots with no walk mode if you wanted, but we wouldn't recommend that because that would be quite painful. And lastly, they are quite durable because of their heavyweight build and the big springs and sort of 
all metal construction of them. They do tend to come up a bit more durable than a very lightweight and spindly tech binding like this one just here. And then there are obviously some cons like I touched on in the introduction. And first of all, they are quite heavyweight. And that's quite an important thing. Some people might like heavier gear when they're alpine skiing, just pure downhill skiing. But in terms of ski touring, every gram counts. So you want to try and shave off as much weight as possible from your setup. And frame bindings, because of the big frame linking them together and their heavyweight construction, they do tend to come up pretty heavy. And secondly, frame bindings are quite inefficient because you are carrying the whole weight of the heel during each stride rather than a tech binding that just allows your heel to pivot free, um, totally friction free. Frame bindings, they have a bit of friction built in here into this joint here at the front. And then you're, again, like I said, you're carrying the whole weight of the heel through each stride. And that will really add up, especially when you're going on sort of big, bigger backcountry missions. And then you've also got the increased stack height. So if I try and compare these, you can't really see it because these, these bindings aren't mounted on a ski, but the stack height, i.e. The, the amount that the binding raises your foot off the ski is quite raised on a frame binding. Whereas a pin binding, the stack height, and it depends on the binding, but the stack height tends to be pretty low. You tend to be able to sit quite close to the ski. And a lot of people like that for the increased responsiveness feeling of the binding. And that's it with a frame binding. They are really good bits of kit to get people into ski touring. Um, the more and more touring you do, the more and more that you'll want to move away from frame bindings. But if you're someone who is really pro downhill performance with your skiing, then you might want to look at frame bindings. So let's look at the good stuff of tech bindings or pin bindings, whatever you want to call them. Um, so tech bindings, they are obviously lightweight. They're extremely lightweight. They're normally made of either lightweight aluminium or sort of carbon infused plastic, which really helps to bring the weight down. Um, they're extremely inefficient. Like I said, if we just take a look, if we compare it to the frame binding, with a pin binding, when you are ski touring, you do not have to lift that heavy weight of the heel up on every stride. And also another benefit is if you look at the pivot point just here, the pivot point is set back rather than a frame binding where it's pushed forward. So you're pivoting right on your toes, which is really natural. When you're ski touring with a pin binding, you really feel that efficient stride compared to a frame binding in particular. And next up is the repairability of the bindings. They're pretty simple bindings with very few moving parts. And that means that they are pretty easy to repair, especially if you're out on the field doing multi-day hut-to-hut ski tours. You can normally bodge a job together to repair them to at least get you to the next hut or get you down to the resort. Um, or you can go out with a full touring binding repair kit with a load of spare parts, and they're really easy to take apart and replace any broken parts so they're easy to repair and finally i wouldn't necessarily recommend it but i do like tech bindings because you can lock out the toe in no fall scenarios so when your heel is locked down on the binding you can lock out the toe if you are skiing particularly steep backcountry descents when you absolutely do not want to lose a ski then you can lock out the toe and that negates any risk of your ski popping off mid slope and i've seen it happen with some bindings they've just pre-released and pre-ejected um, and left the skier without a ski or with one ski on an extremely steep slope so doing this obviously does totally reduce any chance of the binding releasing and saving your knees but if you're in a no fall zone then it is an extremely helpful thing to have so yeah, that's pin bindings and frame bindings. And wouldn't it be great if someone combined the two together to create a hybrid system? Well, you're in luck because we have what is now called hybrid touring bindings. And a hybrid touring binding essentially combines all the good stuff from a pin binding and a frame binding and combines it into one, obviously, hybrid binding.
This here is a hybrid binding and this, the one that I've got here, is the Armada Shift 13, I believe. Or you might also see it branded as a Salomon Shift or an Atomic Shift. They're essentially just the same company. So they're using the same binding. And the Shift binding allows me to pop the toe just here and turn the binding into a, essentially, a pin binding. If I get the toe in just there, you can see that it's a pin binding for the way up. I can lock the brakes out and use heel risers just here. And I can essentially just flip or shift the binding back into alpine mode and it uses both an alpine toe and heel unit for full downhill performance. And these bindings are really good. They're really surging in popularity thanks to their safe nature, yet still retaining that good tech binding efficiency for the way up. And some other really well executed hybrid bindings are the Marker Duke PT16 or maybe the, even the um, Marker Kingpin. So yeah, that's sort of a whistle stop tour on ski touring bindings or the different types of ski touring bindings. But now let's look at all the factors that go into ski touring bindings that make them good or bad. And the first of all, and probably the most important is retention. And people call that elasticity. And elasticity is essentially how elastic the binding is. So when you're skiing downhill and your foot is fully in the binding. I right, put this boot in. Elasticity essentially represents how far side to side and forwards and backwards your foot is allowed to move in the binding without releasing. A binding with better retention or elasticity is a good binding as it allows your boots to travel sideways, very minimal movement sideways, before ejecting or pre-releasing as some people like to call it. Elastic travel is really good at smoothing out those vibrations, say particularly if you're skiing on extremely hard icy snow, you get loads of judders and vibrations. Um, elastic travel really helps to sort of smooth that out, it's a bit of a dampening effect. And elastic travel is marked in millimetres and the millimetres represent how many millimetres side to side the binding will move before releasing you from the binding. Linked to elastic travel is what's called forward pressure. Forward pressure, like I said, is a big spring in the back of the heel. It just butts that heel unit against the back of your boot to stop your heel pre-releasing from the binding. And that's why lightweight tech bindings have to be set up with what's called a tech gap. And I won't get into a tech gap too much because it can get quite confusing. But a tech gap is essentially the distance between the binding and your boot. And it requires a bit of space to allow the pins to travel forward as your ski flexes, rather than just ramming up against the back of your boot and again, just ejecting you straight away. And then essentially opposite to forward pressure or retention is what's called release. And release is obviously how easily does the binding release your boot from the ski um, in the event of a twisting fall to save your knee from potential ligament, 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 ligament knee damage or even a broken leg. And touring bindings have come along leaps and bounds since the very original tech bindings, which essentially had very little release, to be quite honest. Uh, if you look at this binding, it has a DIN, what is it, from six all the way to 13, and that is a fully certified DIN rating. Traditional tech bindings aren't certified for DIN ratings, so that's important to remember as well. So these bindings are very safe. And yeah, like I said, Release values are measured in DIN certification, which is essentially an industry-wide certification to make sure that every binding is releasing pretty much at the same value that you set it to. And modern ski touring bindings have a really versatile DIN range that normally caters towards all different ski styles and skier builds as well. And the DIN rating that you choose, I'm sure you know with Alpine downhill bindings, is essentially based on your height, your weight, and your ski style. If you are after sort of a lower DIN binding, then something like the Armada Shift 10 is really good to look at. Or if you're a bigger, more aggressive skier, and you want a larger DIN range, then the Marker Duke PT16 is a really good binding to look at. So there are different scales of bindings to cater for all of the markets. So as with everything that is ski touring, 
Weight plays a really critical factor in your choice of ski touring bindings. And similar to everything else with ski touring, there are always trade-offs. So with a heavier weight binding, you are obviously getting more performance. But if you want a lighter weight binding, like a very lightweight tech binding, you do get less performance, i.e. less retention and safety. So last thing to note is heel rises. And obviously you won't see these at all on any Alpine downhill bindings because you don't need heel rises. Heel rises essentially allow you to pop your boot on a platform for steeper skin tracks. So when your boot is in ski touring mode, as you can see, I flipped it into ski touring mode. I can use these risers to go from zero degrees, i.e. flat on the ski, and flip them over, which allows me to be at an angle. So if you imagine the skin track is a bit steeper, it allows me to keep my foot relatively flat as I skin up. The steeper I get, the bigger risers I want on the boot, on the binding, sorry. If you look at this shift binding, it only has one riser. So it's got the flat or nearly flat mode. And then we'll just take a look at it here. It's in touring mode. It's only got the one riser. So some people won't like having the additional height of the extra riser for really steep skin tracks. But to be honest, I've been using this binding loads and I've never really felt like I needed that extra riser. So there you go then, there is our whistle stop tour on everything there is to know about ski touring bindings. And obviously there's loads to take in and loads more actually to, that you can go into more detail about ski touring bindings. So if you do have any questions, then just pop them down in the comments below and I'll try and answer them for you as soon as possible. And of course, if you're new here, then just be sure to subscribe by clicking the subscribe button below. Otherwise, I'll see you this time next week on the Empora Ski Cabin, where we'll be taking a look at the base treatment that allows me to never have to wax my skis again.